One of the most important conversations at the World Economic Forum in Davos has been around the impact that artificial intelligence will have on the workflow and on boardrooms in companies all across the world in the year 2025. To talk about the trends being witnessed globally and the implications for Indian companies, I'm joined the promenade at the World Economic Forum in Davos by Nitin Mittal. He's a principal at Deloitte Consulting, expert on generative artificial intelligence and really studies the trends being seen in AI and its application in companies across the world. So Nitin, welcome and thank you for taking our time. Thank you, Rahul. I want to ask you about the most critical trends that you're seeing in 2025 that you think are most relevant for companies back home, people working in those companies, their managements, when they're seeing you, you know, what is it that you think they need to look out for the most this year? I would call out three specific uh, trends, sovereign AI, agentic AI, and edge AI. To put it very simply, sovereign AI is the trend where countries and regions are actually investing in building the necessary and critical infrastructure. Agentic AI can perhaps best be explained by the notion that we are seeing the pivot in generative AI going from telling something to doing something. Now, actions can be undertaken through agentic AI. And uh, edge AI is where all the prowess and the promise of uh, generative AI is going beyond the cloud into the physical world like a factory floor. And those are the three trends that are playing out globally and will also have a bearing in the Indian context for Indian companies as well as how perhaps the Indian government would be uh, progressing further. So let's take these one by one, right? When it comes to sovereign AI, I think a lot of Indian companies seem to be focusing on the use cases of artificial intelligence rather than the initial debate which seemed to uh, hover around them trying to build their own large language models. Now they're saying, okay, so these models are likely to be commoditized. Let's focus on application. Do you think that's the right approach for a country like India at a national level? Or do you think that some of these companies are missing tricks and should actually be taking sovereign deeper in the way that, say, a China has or America organically has and trying to build them uh, sovereign AI? From a sovereign AI perspective, uh, there's probably three things that would be critical. One is the infrastructure that is required. Second is uh, a country would probably need some degree of, uh, let's say, kind of own proprietary LLMs that are more attuned to the culture, heritage, language, and essentially the aspects of that specific uh, region. Because LLMs, in a sense, uh, will preserve the cultural heritage of that country. If the only LLMs that you end up using are in the English language, you may or may not necessarily end up uh, either representing or even preserving your cultural uh, heritage. And in a country like India, which is extremely diverse with a multitude of languages, that is absolutely important. That is why my view is in India, we do have to go deeper in terms of uh, the sovereignty of the actual LLMs, the models and the technology that is uh, requisite. So that's the second aspect. The third, absolutely the application, the application of these LLMs, the application of generative AI, the return on investment that you actually get, as well as how those use cases are going to manifest themselves, either in terms of employee productivity or in terms of business process efficiency or in terms of competitiveness as it relates to Indian organizations. Let's come to the second aspect that you mentioned, which is agentic AI, which is from just answering queries to actually doing things. What do you think are the most important trends and developments that we're likely to see in agentic AI this year and the impact that they could have on Indian companies? Yeah, what is happening with respect to agentic AI right now? The focus is task automation, wherein certain discrete tasks can absolutely be autonomously executed. What we are likely to see over the next 12 months is that more and more of these agents that autonomously execute tasks are going to be stitched together or orchestrated so that you end up with what is called multi-agentic systems. And those multi-agentic systems are going to start automating jobs, not just tasks. And therein lies both the beauty and the challenge. The beauty essentially is the massive augmentation of what we do 
and essentially the efficiency that you could derive from it. The challenge is that you are starting to automate jobs and we have to be very thoughtful from an enterprise perspective and specifically in India, the impact to the larger society, impact to the workforce, impact to employ kind of reskilling and how we actually progress with it. Let's spend some time on the impact on jobs because no matter what the moral argument may be, there is also the economic argument and the rationale if there's a productivity increase and if you can do that through automation and robotics, jobs will be lost. And there's a huge debate raging about the quantum of that job loss and job disruption. So what are your current estimates in terms of the impact that all these trends that you're talking about in the world of AI are likely to have on jobs this year in a country like India? It is likely. In the short term, there would be impact in jobs and it could result in essentially redundancies, for sure. But every technological revolution from the days of the Industrial uh, Revolution have kind of shown us that more technological progress leads to increase in economic productivity, increase in workforce productivity and also kind of uh, how we proceed and how we progress as society, which creates more jobs than the short term impact. So the mid and long term prognosis will definitely be that it will create and unleash a lot many more jobs and economic opportunities for people than what actually uh, the losses could be in a short term sense. In the long term everyone's dead Nitin. <laughs> so let's focus on the short term and you spoke of redundancies and as a percentage what kind of redundancies are you anticipating? Let's take one area rather than kind of uh, generalizing it. Let's take uh, customer service. It is absolutely expected that when it comes to agent tech AI, we are going to see impact on jobs in customer service. Example, call center. We can all attribute a percentage to it, whether it's 20% or 30%. We can attribute a percentage to it, but we will see that type of an impact. The question is... But why just 20, 30? It could be much more. If your queries can be answered by machines, uh, then I don't need some person in Bengaluru or... Aurangabad or where have you answering these questions on the phone in an accent I don't particularly follow? The machine can answer the question. The machine as yet cannot create an experience. The machine as yet cannot necessarily empathize. The machine as yet cannot carry on the conversation in a manner that is contextual. That will take time. That's why we cannot necessarily say that in a short term, in 12 months or so, that you're going to see a quantum kind of impact on the uh, actual jobs and uh, it would uh, perhaps be at a significant level because there's the contextualization, there's the experiential aspect that these agents, LLMs and machines are not necessarily as yet ready. The concern I have as I speak to different kinds of experts at the World Economic Forum is about whether corporates and companies and consultancies are underplaying the prospects of job loss to ensure that there is no fear or paranoia or backlash. The problem with that is that then you're not telling people what to brace for. Isn't it much better to have open and frank conversations so people know what to expect and can upskill and prepare rather than being hit by the, uh, by the iceberg when the Titanic hits it? So I think uh, here's what I would say. There tends to be paranoia about job loss, but the reality is this. We work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. If the focus is what would be the impact on how job is currently being performed in a very traditional manner, then yes, that paranoia will come to fruition. But if the focus is how should we be reimagining what the job should be, the reskilling associated with it and the reorientation of the business process, not just the streamlining of the business process, it opens up new avenues for growth. And I can say this very confidently because we work with, uh, frankly, thousands of uh, customers and clients uh, around the world when we focus on reimagination, as opposed to just playing to the paranoia of job losses, it tends to be a lot more fruitful. And what you need to be prepared for is how are you going to compete in the age of AI by reimagining processes, reimagining jobs, reimagining functions, as opposed to what will happen to me. So spend some time talking to those watching about how they should equip themselves, mid-career, starting out, or C-suite. Uh, to deal with the changes that are coming because unlike you, most aren't experts on artificial intelligence. They do their own job and now 
there are factors way beyond their control, technologies they don't fully comprehend, which are impacting their lives in a very real way, disrupting their work, if not completely leaving them redundant. I'll take our example within uh, my own company, Deloitte, okay, in terms of how we think of it, because it's uh, relevant uh, to any enterprise. And we've got a large workforce in India, so it's kind of very relevant to organizations uh, in uh, India as well. There's two things I would kind of uh, highlight. Today, we look for answers in the context of the job that we perform. Tomorrow, what we need to be prepared for is asking the right questions. The shift has to take place in terms of seeking an answer to perform a job to actually thinking critically of the right questions so that the job could be performed through a combination of humans and machines. That's one shift. Second, that we are preparing for is an actual cultural shift. And the cultural shift is, today we have one workforce. It's a carbon-based workforce, AKA us. Tomorrow, we're gonna have both a carbon and a non-carbon-based workforce where we are gonna have intelligent machines who are going to be our digital co-workers. So we have to adapt our thinking, our ways of doing work, and how we are going to provide, in our case, client service to Fortune 500 companies and beyond through a combination of both a human and a digital workforce. Those are the type of adaptation we have to do, and that's the type of adaptation every organization would perhaps have to go through. Let's spend some time about the kind of improvements we may see in artificial intelligence models this year. One of the debates I've been hearing at the World Economic Forum is whether a lot of these LLMs are now saturating and plateauing in the short term. That all the data that they could have scrapped, which is available publicly, has already been read, incorporated into the models, and therefore uh, the capabilities of these AI models will roughly stay or grow very incrementally uh, rather than change uh, in the way that may have initially been imagined last year or the year before. So it is likely that you'll have some kind of a plateauing uh, effect. But that plateauing effect is all based on data that is publicly available. That's not the majority of the data. The majority of the data is within your four walls, within an organization, within a community, or within any other context. That is still, by and large, untapped. One of the trends that we will absolutely see this year is both the verticalization of these models and LLMs in the context of an industry, in the context of your enterprise, in the context of your business, and they will become more and more proprietary wherein they're trained on your data with your context for your specific needs and for the use cases that you want to focus on as opposed to just the general LLMs that are out there who can essentially... Uh, let's say kind of infer so a particular small, answer. Small models rather than... Small large models. models. Small models, lot more proprietary and lot more contextualized. You know, the other big question of course is about uh, general AI, you know, AGI, and whether we're heading in that direction, whether we're not tech uh, enthusiasts and technologists keep arguing with each other, looked at from a corporate lens. Uh, where does that l seem on the horizon for you? Distant future, uh, can't be seen, panacea, or something you really need to look out for? Well, I'm certainly not going to try to look into the crystal ball to try to uh, predict how uh, AGI may play out. But I would essentially say that the sophistication of the models is absolutely proceeding at a, sp uh, at a speed and pace right now that what is very likely in the midterm is um, what I would call super augmented intelligence. It may not necessarily just be artificial general intelligence that is absolutely ubiquitous, but we will have the means wherein our own experience, our own level of intelligence, and our own uh, intuition is going to be augmented to a greater degree to create that synergy and super intelligence wherein a combination of intelligent machines and sophisticated algorithms with humans will perhaps lead to better answers, better ways of solving problems and better experiences. This has been a fascinating conversation. Nitin, for taking our time, joining us here at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Thank you so much. Have a safe journey back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.